Hello, this is Rochelle Agatha, and this lecture is on the Sarbanes-Oxley Act um, and internal controls, cash, and bank recs. So let's get started. The objectives of this um, lecture are to describe the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, also known as SOX, um, of 2002 and its impact on internal controls and financial reporting. It did change a great deal um, of the way controls are accounted for and audited, and it plays a big part in what accountants do. Um, we're going to describe and illustrate the objectives and elements of internal control. We're going to describe and illustrate the application of internal controls to cash, um, the nature of a bank account and its use in controlling cash. Um, we're going to describe and illustrate the use of a bank reconciliation and the accounting for special purpose cash funds, such as petty cash. And finally, we're going to describe and illustrate the reporting of cash and cash equivalents in the financial statements. So. The first objective is the, to describe the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 and its impact on internal controls and financial reporting. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, referred to simply as Sarbanes-Oxley, or we call it SOX, applies only to companies whose stock is traded on the public um, stock exchange. Its purpose was to restore public confidence and trust in financial statements. However, SOX has um, been bled into the world of accounting in many other ways. If you're a nonprofit, they're trying, they're starting to get you with SOX through the tax return process. And there are a lot of companies that even though they don't have stock and they're not traded on the stock exchange, they follow the internal control structure of SOX because it it um, provides that benefit to um, when you're getting a loan and when banks look at you, if you can have a SOX like control structure, it helps in the long run. Sarbanes Oxley requires companies maintain strong and effective internal controls. Internal control is broadly defined as the procedure and process used by a company to safeguard its assets process information accurately and ensure compliance with laws and regulations. So here, um, here's kind of what it looked like before Sarbanes-Oxley um, Enron and if you have been around for a while you remember the Enron days. Um, there was Enron Tyco, WorldCom, there was a lot of fraud and theft that happened and the investors and the stockholders and the creditors were shocked because everyone went along like like nothing had happened and they assumed these controls were in place. Then came SOX in 2002 which just initiated a huge amount of um, control that has to be in place and now um, theoretically after SOX there are these effective internal controls to prevent fraud and theft, theft and the, make the stockholders happy. So that's kind of where we're headed here. Um, so just, just to go back to this, I'll give you um, just a theoretical. What we're trying to get to is when you talk about internal controls, if you think about cash and, you know, just think about a simple one. If you have, if you have money in a cash register and um, you leave the cash register where anybody can get to it, you know, most people think I got to lock my cash register up and I need to have people count a cash register drawer and uh, you know have two people count it and sign off and that that's kind of been around forever SOX adds layers of control uh, around things other than just physical cash in a cash register um, because with the electronic age and um, so much that is done online and through the internet and a lot of stuff isn't on paper anymore and so these controls are supposed to be there um, to help prevent things from from not being, you know, affected and having fraud and theft happen. Describe and illustrate the objectives and elements of internal control. The objectives of internal control are to provide reasonable assurance that assets are safeguarded and used for business purposes, business information is accurate, and employees comply with laws and regulations. So those are the objectives of internal control. Employee fraud is the intentional act of deceiving an employer for personal gain. The five elements of internal control, okay, the objectives were what we just talked about. Now these are the elements of internal control. Management is responsible for designing and applying five elements of internal control to meet the three internal control objectives. So there's three objectives, five elements. The elements are the control environment, risk assessment, control procedures, monitoring, 
and information and communication. So you as management of a company are responsible for designing your control structure so that it meets these five elements. So here's a picture where you, you can see your control threats and within it you have your monitoring, your risk assessment, and um, risk control and assessment procedure and your control environment and that's supposed to protect the management in the business and you you need the information and communication. So here's just a little visual for you. The control environment, a business's control environment is the overall attitude of management employees about the importance of control. So I know um, as a CFO of a company that I have a certain level of um, gut or f you know attitude towards fraud and I would say I'm a highly conservative person and my business you know control environment is one that is you know conservative and you know your control environment is supposed to represent the the management's attitude and so yes you know there is a, a decent amount that comes into play when the management and the people get involved in designing it so SOX is trying to make it so that it's like a checklist almost so that certain things occur and there is you know it's not subjective the factors that influence the control environment management's philosophy and operating style so as I just mentioned you know I'm a highly conservative manager and um, you know, being a CFO, I, um, you know, I, that's, that's kind of my job to be that way. The business's organizational structure, personnel policies, I'm going to go back a minute. So those, those are the factors that influence the control environment, those three things. So you want all of those things and you have to kind of consider them when you develop your um, internal controls. So here's a picture of your control environment and just kind of shows you that these are the factors that you consider. Example of control procedures for all night convenience store. So let's talk about a convenience store. So you're going to locate the cash register near the door so that's fully visible from the outside of the store. Have two employees work late hours, employee security guard. Okay, so this is an effective control. Deposit cash in the bank daily before 5 p.m. Keep only small amounts of cash on hand after 5 p.m. by depositing excess cash in a store safe that can't be opened by employees on duty. Install cameras and alarm systems. Okay, so if you think about it, if you've ever worked in retail, these, these things seem like common sense. And I think people understand that when you're talking about physical cash, it's easy to identify what you need to do for proper internal controls. The warning signs with regard to people. Um, there's indicators of internal control problems and there's, there's the warning signs with regard to people. Abrupt change in lifestyle. Close social relationships with suppliers. Refusing to take a vacation. Frequent borrowing from other employees. Excess use of alcohol or drugs. Oops. So, you know, there's, a, there's several more that you could think of, but these are the big ones. So when you're a manager and you manage the financial side of life like I do, you know, you look for things. You make your staff take vacations. You make sure that, that people are cross-trained. Um, you look for relationships that people have with um, suppliers and vendors, things where some fraud would be more prevalent. Then there's the indicators of internal control problems, warning signs from the accounting system. Missing documents are gaps in transaction numbers. Okay, so, um, you know, being a relatively new accounting student and maybe never having worked in accounting, you know, you look for things. We're going to talk about the bank rec in a, in a little bit. You look for, you know, s uh, check sequences and you make sure there's no gaps in deposit numbers or check numbers. An unusual increase in customer refunds. Okay, if you're giving your customers refunds, that could be a sign that, um, that the, the purchases never really took place. Differences between daily cash receipts and bank deposits. Sudden increase in slow payments. So all of a sudden the vendors aren't, don't seem to be paying as well. Maybe because somebody's siphoning the payments off the top. Backlog and recording transactions. So the third objective is to describe and illustrate the application of internal controls to cash. The control of cash receipts. One of the most important controls to protect cash received in over-the-counter sales is a cash register. A predetermined amount of money that is given to each cash register clerk in a cash drawer is called a change fund so that you make sure that you know what that predetermined amount is. 
So let's talk about cash over and short. So here's an example. Your cash sales for March totaled $3,150 per the cash register tape. After removing the change fund, only $3,142 was on hand. So there's your cash. There's your cash over and short. And there's your sales. So if you track your cash over and short, then you can keep track of what's going on. And you know, $10 here, $10 there, if you're tracking it by the person who's recording the cash, then you, you, you would know if something was happening. Here's a, a diagram of ca control of cash receipts. So the cash comes in the door and the person gets a receipt. Then there's a cash register. The receipts go to the accounting department and the accounting department it ultimately makes a journal entry. The cash register cash goes to the cashier's department. It's deposited into the bank. So you want a separation of duties within all of these different um, sets of duties. Electronic fund transfers, you know, kind of change things um, from an accounting standpoint. Cash may be received from customers through electronic fund transfers. Customers may authorize automatic electronic transfers from their checking accounts to pay bills. So you probably know this as an employee where you have your money put into your bank account. Same goes the other way for a, a um, employer. They might ha pay their vendors electronically. A voucher system is set is a set of procedures for authorizing and recording liabilities and cash payments. It may be either manual or computerized. So you need controls around um, not only if you have an EFT system, you you want a voucher system where you have a um, a set of documents that make up your voucher. So you can prove the sale, the receipt. Um, you know the purchase, the receipt, and the ultimate payment, and it makes a, a little package so you can trace the transaction all the way through its steps. A voucher is any document that serves as a proof of authority to pay cash or issue an electronic fund transfer. Uh, lots of times um, it's an invoice or you know people think of it as an invoice. The fourth objective is to describe the nature of the bank account and its use in controlling cash the use of bank accounts. The major reason that businesses use bank accounts is to control cash and this is where auditors are going to look to see where your cash you know where your cash went, where it came from, where it went and ultimately what the balance is at the end of a given period and we call that the cash the control account on your books. Lots of times companies will have multiple bank accounts. They'll have a payroll bank account and a general bank account and whatnot. Bank accounts provide an independent recording of cash transactions that can be used as a verification of businesses recording of transactions. So we all have personal bank accounts so we know kind of in general what we're talking about here. A bank statement is a summary received from the bank of all checking account transactions um, and that's called the bank statement. So a bank statement would have you know automatic deposits, manual deposits, checks, EFTs, interest earned, etc. And so you need to do what we call a bank rec on a bank account. So here's a typical example of a bank statement. So you can see um, the date at the top and there was total deposits, total withdrawals, and then all the detail, checks, deposits, date, balance, and here's the bottom half of it. So we're going to learn how to do a bank rec. And I know, I mean, I do a bank rec for myself every month. I use Quicken. I download everything through my bank. Um, some people don't, and they don't even look at what's going through their bank. So this probably be an eye opener for you if you're one of those kind of folks. Typical credit or debit memorandum entries found on the bank statement. You, you might see an error correction, non-sufficient funds, a service charge, an automated clearinghouse entry for electronic fund transfers or some kind of miscellaneous item. So you should check your own bank statement out and see if you see these kinds of things. Um, the following items may appear on a bank statement. An NSF check, an EFT deposit, a service charge, a bank correction. So you would need to do something when you get your bank statement with all this stuff because 10 to 1 your books don't know that you've got these things going on. So here's an example of items that appear on the bank statement as a debit or a credit memo and they either increase or decrease the balance of the bank account. So this over here, um, so a debit memorandum is going to decrease the balance of the depositor's bank account. A credit memorandum is going to increase the depositor's bank account. Um, and I don't know why that's on there twice, so we'll skip that one. Um, let's go back. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back up here. So check them out. An NSF check is number one. An EFT is number two. A service charge is number three. And a four is a bank correction. Okay, so the first one's a debit memorandum, which decreases the depositor's bank account. The second one is a credit, 
which would increase. The third one is a debit, which would decrease. And the fourth one is a debit, which would decrease. So I'd print when you print these slides out, put these side by side so that you can see that if you have an NSF check that appeared on the bank account, okay, because you didn't know about it, that's going to decrease your depositor's bank account information. Okay. So here's an example of what a, a bank rec looks like for this um, power networking account. You, we're going to go through and we'll actually walk through a bank rec, but you have a bank statement beginning balance and you have a books beginning balance. So this is your GL down here, okay? The beginning balance of your GL, the beginning balance of your bank. In the top part, you're going to add deposits and anything miscellaneous, and you're going to deduct checks, NSF checks, and service charges to get this adjusted, you know, this ending balance. Then on the book side, you're going to have a beginning balance and you're going to have deposits and checks. Notice these two don't equal. You want these two to equal, so you need to figure out what the problem is. Um, describe and illustrate the use of a bank rec in reconciling and control of ca controlling cash. So now we're going to figure out what to do with all these things. A bank rec is an analysis of the items and amounts that cause the cash balance reported in the bank statement to differ from the balance of the cash account in the ledger. So in other words, you do a bank rec to get your book balance and your bank balance down to a true cash balance because neither one is really what you have in cash. So here is um, an example that, uh, like a problem you're going to do in your homework where you have your cash balance according to your bank statement. You're going to do two reconciliations and you're going to come down to one adjusted balance. You're going to add your deposits in transit. So those are the things that you deposited in your books, but the bank doesn't show them as deposited yet. Then you're going to um, deduct your outstanding checks, and you're going to have an adjusted balance. On the um, book side, you're going to have your beginning balance, and you're going to add anything the bank knew about that you didn't know about, like an error in a check. For instance, maybe the bank recorded a check as 4715 instead of 4175, and then maybe they collected a note for you and you hadn't recorded it yet with interest. Then you want to deduct your service charges. So when you're done, your adjusted balances are the same, and they will always be the same, and if they're not, you have to figure out why. So let's walk through an example. Here's this network, power network company. So they have their beginning balance. This is the GL. GL, this is the bank statement. Okay. Then there's a deposit of 81620 that did not appear on the bank statement. So you're going to add that to the bank's records because you have that in your books. Then the bank collected a note in the amount of $400 and the related interest. So the bank knew about that, but you didn't know about that. So you're going to add it to your side. Three checks that were written during the period did not appear on the bank statement, so those are outstanding checks. Those add up to outstanding checks. Uh, bank returned a check of 300 from the customer, so that you're going to deduct NSF checks on the book side. And there's a service charge of 18 bucks, so you're going to deduct that. Check number 879 to Taylor Company was recorded accidentally as 723. So you have, notice there's a difference there, 732 versus 723. So that's an error in the on the book side. And when all said and done, there's your adjusted balance, and they're the same. So this will help you um, if you're taking um, the Excel class online too, that you would do this pro a problem like this there. So um, note that when you're all said and done, this is your true cash balance that you want in your GL when all said and done. Notice it is not the same as either one of these numbers, and that is why you do a bank rec to control your cash. So here's what it looks like in this format. Um, when you're done, you have to do some journal entries to, to record all that stuff. So all these things here, over here, need to get recorded in your, in your books. So um, here's your company records, and you're going to record the, the different items, the note receivable collected with the interest, and um, here we show the summary again, and then you're going to record the Thomas Ivy uh, miscellaneous expense and account receivable and the payment. That was the NSF check that, that um, was an error in recording of check number 879. So there's, you can do, see here they did three things in one. They did the bank service charge, the NSF check, and the 
error in the recording of the check. Okay, so that you could do them all in one journal entry. Um, the following data were gathered to use in reconciling the bank accounts. So here's here's some information for this company called Photo Op. There's a balance per the bank, a balance per the records, a bank service charge, a deposit and transit. So think to yourself before I flip the side. Okay, I know. Um, sorry about that. I know I have two balances, a bank and a company. Then I have these things I need to do something with. So I'm going to do what we just did on the previous slide. Um, you need to come up with the adjusted balance on the bank rec and then journalize the entries. So um, you're going to get your bank section of the reconciliation. So you have your 14500 minus the 5250 plus the 3750. And then on the company side, you have the 13875 minus the 75 minus the 800. So print these slides out. This gives you two separate examples to, to follow through on your own. Go back and see if you can create this in the format that we just did that looked like, like this. Okay, so I want you to be able to do it because you're going to have to do several problems. So that's why I'm giving you two examples of how to get to the bank balance and the book balance. Then you're going to do your journal entry to book the things that weren't in your accounts, which was the service charge and the, um, the accounts receivable. Once again, I'm going to show you again what we just talked about. You're going to take that information from the previous slide. And you could, if you can set something like this up and get to the adjusted balance in your own mind, um, that's a bank wreck, and it's as simple as that. It's just a matter of making sure that the two tie you know, if they don't, you need to investigate that. You know, if it's off by 20 cents, that's one thing. But if it's off by 5, 10 bucks, then you look for stuff because that's where fraud happens when small amounts of money are missing and nobody can account for it. Um, remember, employees will steal small. They, they typically don't go real big because they're afraid. Um, people that steal big tend to disappear. Describe the accounting for special purpose cash funds. Um, it is usually not practical for a business to write checks to pay for small amounts. So, you you know, if you've worked for a company, I have petty cash. I need to go buy some batteries and, you know, I need to I need to go to the post office and get some stamps. And I'm not a big um, fan of petty cash funds. I typically don't like them. But they, they do serve a purpose, you know, depending on the kind of company that you have. Um, so on August 1st, they issued check number 511 for 500 to establish a petty cash fund. So this is how you establish the petty cash fund. You debit an account in your GL called petty cash and you credit cash. You're just moving the money from your main bank account and you actually are putting it in a drawer. So you do do a journal entry because this is sitting in a cash drawer somewhere. At the end of August, you're going to keep all your receipts for office supplies, postage, etc., and you're going to book a journal entry. So you're actually going to debit all the things that happen and you're going to credit cash. Notice there's no entry to petty cash here because once you establish the fund, you don't do anything with it unless you decrease it or increase it. Okay, so here's your monthly journal entry. You replenish the petty cash fund um, to restore it to its original amount of $500. Note that there is no entry to petty cash when the fund is replenished. Okay, that's what I just said. Businesses often use special cash funds to meet other needs such as payroll. These are funds are called special purpose funds. Um, so here let's do a little example. Prepare journal entries for each of the following. Issued a check to establish a petty cash fund. And they tell you the amount of the petty cash fund is currently 120. You issued a check to replenish it um, for these different amounts. So there's our petty cash, establishing our petty cash fund. Here's our journal entry to replenish it. So hopefully those two give you an example. Um, look through them both, see if you can do it, because you're going to have to do um, some homework like this. The seventh objective is to describe and illustrate the reporting of cash and cash equivalents in the financial statements. A company's excess cash is normally invested in highly liquid investments. These investments are called cash equivalents. Companies that have invested excess cash and cash equivalents usually report cash and cash equivalents as one amount on the balance sheet. So you might have some money markets, something other than just cash sitting in a bank account. Banks may require depositors to maintain minimum cash balances in their bank accounts, such as balance is called a compensating balance. Um, so um, in summary, um, just to, to remember that the biggest thing here is the bank rec and you want to be able to do a bank rec. So go through and print the slides out 
and make sure that you can do a bank rec um, from one of the simple problems and then attempt the homework. Um, the next biggest thing out of this chapter is the internal controls and having um, the importance of controls. If you're going to move on as an accounting student, you're going to take several classes, one of which would be auditing, and you're going to spend more time in controls. And there are controls built around everything, not just cash. So this is just our first discussion about controls. But um, SOX really tightened what kind of controls um, companies have to have. So um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, that's it for the lecture. Thanks.